You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Josh Mallerman on the show with me today. He has an amazing new book. It's called A House at the Bottom of a Lake. And this is a uh, this is a head trip uh, for sure. I I love what you're doing in the story. Um, Josh, you might know Josh from uh, a, a little book that he wrote that got turned into uh, a Netflix smash movie called Bird Box, and I think everyone with a with a pulse has seen that movie at this point. Um, but uh, super excited to have you on the show today, Josh. Oh man, same to you. Thank you, thank you in advance for <laughs> for having me. This is awesome. Absolutely, uh, Josh. We begin each show with the same question, and that question is: What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, I actually I have a, re- a pretty good one for this because so I remember um, I think it was like a Hanukkah present or my birthday, but I got a book like, a, you know, a book that for kids, but not not I was old enough to start reading now. So it had there was some some girth to this book. Sure. And I opened the present and I read the entire book from beginning to end. <laughs> my parents must have been like, what is he doing? Um, the minute, the second after I opened it, I read it to everyone in the room, my family. And I have this distinct memory when my, at the end of it, my mom and dad both saying, you read that whole book. And, <laughs> and it was honest to God, man. I, I almost feel like I can trace an entire lifetime and career, career of loving books and this love affair with books and, and horror. It was kind of a freaky story too. Um, all back to this dollop of encouragement, this moment when mom and dad were like you just did that like that was great and i and i i can still feel like to this day i'm like when i finish reading a novel i can almost still hear them like you just read that (laughs) that's amazing (laughs) yeah Uh, we talk a lot on this show about encouragement especially early encouragement and um invariably when i ask that question to people it it brings uh them back to uh to a time where you know the love of what they're doing now is is fresh and new and uh you know hopefully it it stirs up good memories for most people it does um but did your uh, you know after having that accomplishment from uh you know recognized by your parents did uh, did they encourage you to tell stories of your own like how did how did that subject come up well it's a really exciting combination to me in hindsight my dad is all numbers um he's an accountant he but he but he he likes numbers though he's not just an accountant accountant by default you know what i mean right and my mom is more artfully uh more art minded and that she she paints she reads you know and so this combination of a sort of artist who enjoys the numbers even of art and i don't mean paint by numbers i mean like um, as a kid, there was a thing called the Pine Tree Book Awards. Whoever read the most books um, uh, in the course of the year, and it was the whole school district. It wasn't just our own, my own school. Whoever read the most books would like get an award at this, you know, in this auditorium. And and I used to make it, you know, into like the finals or the top three or four in the district all the time. And and I loved the numbers of it. I read thirty books this year. I read thirty two books, and this book is. I read a 200 page book this time. And, and so even from the beginning, there was a certain, like, to me, it's a gorgeous, it can be a gorgeous combination, art and numbers. And I think that without art, numbers can be obviously cold um, in the same way that a fact can just be cold or whatever it is. Right. But with art, numbers can be the ultimate propeller the ultimate like encouragement to me. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'm rewriting a novel right now that is 1,140 pages long, okay? 
and entering it, I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like I'm like overwhelmed. You're on page three and you're like, what is going on? Right. And I started, so I broke it up into landmarks. You have the 100, 200, 300, 400, right? You have the, the quarter mark, the half mark, uh, the third mark, the three quarters mark, the two thirds mark, the, the finish. And then the book's broken up into like seven parts. And I started to recognize like, hey, wait a minute, there's actually like 23 somewhat numerical landmarks in this book. And then if you can, and each one comes at about 50 to 60 pages. So if you can like, you see what I mean? If you can get, if you can like use the numbers and like, I'm excited to reach the two thirds mark. Okay. Sure. The book and the story is, is, you know, what's going to dictate you what to do. But those things help you because if you reach a landmark by page 100, there's a sense of accomplishment rather than just the finished giant work of art that you're like, you know, feel like you're out to sea. You're not you're not getting anything done. You have so much to do. And then you can even bring it to, OK, how long did it take me to do 100? Well, it took me, let's just say, four days. Well, then the whole thing. See what I mean? So. I think like from the word go, there was not a direct like mom and dad were never um what's the right phrase um they they were never discouraging in any way like if i was into writing they were like yes keep going uh i'm in a band they're like yes keep going but more importantly like who they are was and and like where they're like the ways they're bent that was that's like the real like pearls that i like i took from them you know, Josh, I, I think you're absolutely right, and the the points that you brought out are are perfect. Um, but for you know, we have kind of fallen into this trap of believing, and, and not saying that there's not truth to it. Don't don't take it that way, but believing in this right brain versus left brain paradigm, and you're either one or the other. And right. I think we're I think we're robbing ourselves and and the people around us of uh, some great discoveries uh, and by allowing ourselves to uh, to embrace wholeness, uh, for lack of a better word. Dude, I, I totally understand what you're talking about. There's there have been times in my career in my life where I'll be like, oh, I've reached the, you know, hundred thousand word mark. And then I'll see someone say, like, you know, it's not about that. It's about the story. And I'm like, oh, well, I know that. You know, but, <laughs> it's like, I thought that was a given, you know? And so, but then I've had, I've run into, I mean, you know, I've been doing this for a minute yeah. Um, and I've run into scenarios where you can almost be like embarrassed by like how prolific you are. If you meet, if I meet a stranger and I'm like, yeah, I write books and they're like, oh, you know, huh, how many of you write in your son? If I said like two, they'd, they'd probably be like, oh, that's so impressive. But when I tell them the real number, which is 33, you can almost see this like this like dimming light of like, oh, how serious can he be? <laughs> right. <laughs> but if, but you know, I don't have kids and I don't have a day job, meaning I've been, I mean, I was really broke for like a decade, but I've been living off writing and songs since then. So I don't have a day job, I don't have kids. In other words, believe me, 33 is not as much, it should be more. There's enough time in the day to be doing what I'm doing, believe me. There's enough downtime also. So to me, it's like that <sighs> embracing like what you're saying, like you, uh, you don't have to be like, um, you know, I'm full artist or I'm full business or I'm full um, creative or I'm full practical. Right. Right. It, it's OK to be and I'm not a bit I'm, I'm not a business minded artist, but it's OK to be like a numbers and art lover. And just, just like it's just like it's OK to be a sports and art lover. There was a period when we were like younger where it was real dicey to tell someone that you're into sports. You know, you'd be like <laughs> you're surrounded by the most like like the hippiest artists in the world. And you'd be like, man, yeah, did you guys catch the Detroit Lions game? And it would be like <laughs> the record skipped off, you know, like <laughs> the needle skipped off the record. And like <laughs> at some point and then I started reading about like Kerouac played college football and. And Bob Pollard from Gotta Buy Voices, like threw a no hitter. And, and I started to like, OK, there, there's other guys like me out there. And, and I think it, that goes back to what you're saying also. And, it, 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 and I like how you said it because I hadn't thought of it that way. Why not? Instead of seeing it as right and left brain, so, so compartmentalized, why not see that there's the elements of both swirling around in the same 
brain. Right. And and no matter which which side you think you lean more toward, we all have a whole brain. <laughs> there's there's not yeah. one of us walking around on, on you know uh, it, you know medical issues uh, aside, you know, walking around with 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 only the a left or the right. We're we're whole whole people and yeah. maybe this is the the time to start embracing that. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna definitely think more on this. It'll be funny. One day you'll, you maybe you'll hear. Um, or maybe even one day we'll we'll meet in person, and I'll present this as if I thought of it and forgot that you told me. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're welcome to to take it and run with it for whatever it's worth. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josh, um, I I know that your work, your your literary work anyway, um, leans toward the fantastical, um, slash horror, um, and it, maybe horror is not the right word. Um, but you, you do tend to mine, uh, subject matter that, that is uh, a little unsettling and, and gets us to confront maybe our fears, uh, or could you talk a little about, about what it was that got you interested into uh, dealing with darker subjects and, and what, you know, what separates your work from other, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of different subgenres within horror. And I'm, I'm using that as a, as a blanket term. Um, and, and I don't think of your work as like slasher and gross out horror, but getting us to, to look at uh, it, at things that make us uncomfortable, maybe. How do you determine um, where you fit into the genre and what are your thoughts about, um, you know, writing toward the darker side? Well, this is like my favorite subject in the world. Um, so this was a seminal moment for me was I was I was 12 or so and I was playing basketball with my brothers at my cousin's house. And I to this day, I don't know what prompted my uncle, I should write him and find out, but what prompted my uncle to, he, he came outside and there was a break in the game or we stopped playing. And he was like, Josh, there's a movie I think you would love. And I was like, what, me specifically? And he showed, he put on Twilight Zone, the movie for me. Um, it was on a VHS. I remember him putting it in the machine. I remember the opening scene so vividly with Dan Aykroyd uh, and Albert Brooks and Dan Aykroyd saying, hey, you want to see something scary? That <laughs> right. Thing. And it was like, ah, it was like the first like really scary movie I had seen, you know? Right. It was immediate love at love at first sight, like scared out of my mind, scared of the room I was in, scared of my uncle now, scared of like, and like, and, and wonderfully glor gloriously. So as if by being afraid as if by being afraid I had like entered like a slightly different consciousness or a slightly different room or a slightly different reality. And it was like peaked to me and it was more colorful to me and it smelled brighter and it felt brighter and I felt more alive. And so, but that the influence of that moment doesn't just stop with like opening the horror door. Think of the movie he actually played for me. So it's like the ultimate in like, um, uh, different like varieties of horror right hold on one second yeah so it opens with the social commentary the vic morrow is a total racist maniac right and then right. he gets his due you know he, he ends up being like a jew uh, escaping nazis and a black guy escaping a hanging you know he has to so he has to live those lives so that's the first one the first segment the second segment is um the heartwarming um, uh, heartstrings of Spielberg with Kick the Can and Scatman Crothers. So then it's like, here's supernatural and freaky, but warm. The third one is Imagination Unchained Anything Goes, where the boy Anthony can do anything with his mind. Um, and he removes his sister's mouth. He turns his house into like a cartoon, you know, all that stuff. He can literally do anything with his mind. And then the fourth one is the creature feature, which is the monster on the airplane. Right. So the very first movie I saw, was so diverse. It was the, this anthology that was so diverse that my introduction to horror was, look, it can be anything. And I have seen through the years reviews of, you know, Unburied Carol versus Bird Box versus Inspection um, versus Black Man Wheel. And people will say like, 
um, when talking about me, they'll say that, you know, it, you almost can't even recognize that the same guy wrote each book, that they're so different from each other, that they don't repeat until Mallory, which is a sequel of Bird Box. But other than that, um, and I hadn't ever really thought of that myself. It was just like, now let's write a next book. Now let's write the next book, right? And I, at first that worried me in the same way it would with a band. Like you want your voice to be present. You know what I mean? Right. You, you don't want to just like, what do you mean? You, you can't recognize that I wrote Carol and Bird Box. Oh, that's freaky. Like, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to gain someone's trust? The reader's trust. How am I going to gain um, a fandom or something? That's a weird word, but you know what I mean? Yeah. If, if, if I'm, if I'm a freaking chameleon or something, but then I started to see it and I, and I always have seen this as all the books are almost like episodes of a TV show where I would be the host. So Bird Box was like episode one. And I always see it as like black and white, a very, very small story in a house and on a river. Uh, not many characters, you know, n not many scenes outside of the house or on the river. And then on Mary Carol's like a Western. And then, and then Black Man Wheel was like a war story. And so I started, I started to see these as like, these are episodes, like Twilight Zone episodes. And they're all different from each other. And they're all, I wouldn't say different genre because they're, I, I do think that they all fit under the horror umbrella, especially these days where the genre seems more elastic than ever, right? And people seem to be looking for, um, what's that phrase? Um, that like that tweener stuff, right? Like I, I saw a movie, I don't know if you saw it, the, the Wolf of Snow Hollow. Yeah, yeah, I think okay. I did. Yeah. Okay, and I and I was watching it and I said to Alice and my lady, my, my I said to my lady, <laughs> I, said, I said to Alice, I was like, um, man, I, I can't tell. Is this movie like scary? Is it funny? Is it weird? And then I saw like online and I loved it. And I saw people online saying like how awesome it was that um he didn't commit to a single like tone. And I couldn't help but say to myself, five years ago, this would have been this would have been like, you know, gotten trouble for being non-committal but nowadays we want that almost it's like we want weirder or, or more like fresh or original whether that's in representation whether that's in new stories whether that's in blending genre and stretching genre so again i keep coming back to this story of my uncle but i really believe that the man like he gave me like eh, horror on a piece of Laffy Taffy and I was able to stretch it as far as I, I'm still <laughs> able to stretch it as far as I want. So I think that my place in the genre currently, because I do um, consider myself um, like a voice in the genre. I, I, I think there's maybe a hundred of us, but, or maybe even more. Yeah. Um, it's not like I, I think of myself as one of two or something, but um, I do think that somehow my place has become that that sort of on the writing side is a sort of reminder of like hey we can stretch it's okay to not write the same thing at all twice um it's okay to keep trying to grow with each book or to change dramatically it's okay to abandon everything you did the time before but i think that my place on the on the sort of the spiritual side has to do more with um i'm i'm major proponent of um uh momentum and enthusiasm and uh and like the engine behind writing at all like i just i think i had a post um a tweet the other day that was like i read 60 books this year you know what screw it five stars each 300 stars <laughs> <laughs> you know it's because I, I just like i don't know with every book i read i feel like i'm able to like locate that that moment that the kernel that inspired the author to write it in the first place. Right. And I think that to me, that's enough, man. And then the yeah. person who actually did it. That's enough for me. Like, yeah, of course I can like analyze and go crazy on this and that. And, 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 uh, classics or brand new ones, indie or big five. Of course I can do that. And of course I love reading other people's reviews. Well, when it comes to me, I'm coming from a very, I don't want to say spiritual because that starts to sound bizarrely religious, but this spirited place of like, let's yeah. go, let's, yeah. let's roll, roll, let's roll, let's do it. And, and I have a million things to say on that subject, but I do think that in terms of your question, where, where I fit into the genre, I think the, that those two answers are right. With the books, it's the more elasticity of the genre and with the 
and with the actual just like how to or how we're all living and whatever, I think there's some sense of like momentum and 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 urgency and and enthusiasm and love for writing. Talking about um mixing um genre and uh, kind of opening the boundaries of genre to to allow for some of the the weirder stuff. Um, you know, like like you talked about um a minute ago. Don't you feel like that by expanding the genre you actually make the genre more potent um and and by what i mean by that is a horror movie to me is much more scary or much more impactful if you give me moments of levity in in the midst of that to where i can let my guard down i can breathe a little i can laugh a little and then when you hit me with the more uh you know, strange elements and the, the, the actual scary elements, um, they're more impactful because I'm allowed to kind of ride the roller coaster of emotion. Um, don't you, how do you feel about that? Yeah. I, I think that would like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer that movies are scarier now than they've ever been because of like the sound quality and like, it, like you watch like a new horror movie and it's like I, i'm on like pins and needles the whole time right? <laughs> right and i'm aware that every time there's a breath every time it's daytime that like it's almost like a false like safety i'm like ah oh, shoot like i'm like okay we made it through the night Whew, in that scene right and now the next day i'm like okay i can breathe but then i'm like yeah but i can only breathe because we're building up to being scared again and it's going to be freaking scarier than the last scare you know so yeah <laughs> like i totally know what you mean in the ride of that but i i also think hold on Hold on. Can I, I got to put my cat out of the room. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You want, why, give me one second. Hold on. Hold sure. On. Here, here you go. Run, run to the hill. Okay. But I also think in, in a uh, tangential, but linked to what you're saying, is that like <laughs> the fear of the unknown, right? Obviously we all, we all talk about this often, right? But that can stretch all the way to style to author to filmmaker meaning okay the first time i saw um texas chainsaw massacre there was a feeling of not just who who is this leatherface guy but a feeling of who made this right <laughs> and like and this feeling of like where did they make this and like and i think that's one major argument for not that any argument needs to be made anymore necessarily but for watching like foreign horror films right because the sensibilities are a little different. The rhythms are a little different, meaning unknown. So you don't know exactly when the scare is coming right. in a foreign right. horror film. You don't know exactly the arc. It's not exactly the same. It's there's like a an American or a Western, whatever arc that we're, you know, you're aware of. Like I said, it's the next morning. Everything's fine. Whew, we're going to build ourselves up tonight again. Right. You don't find that everywhere else. I even watched The Ring recently, the original and there were moments that I was like, gee, wait, that was like the weirdest place for a scare. Like, go watch that one again and you'll see what I mean. And, and so I think that it, 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 it's the stretching of the genre. Not only is it exciting and fresh, but it actually, like you said, makes things more potent and scarier because you're not familiar with this combination yet. You're not familiar with this blend of elements um what movie recently i mean it follows was one that did that to me where i was like who made this that which that's a weird story because he turned out to be from like right around where i'm from um but like that sense of I, i'm always aware of that that the author the artist him or herself could actually be the scariest element to the film because like way beyond the monster and whatever, just because you don't know his or her style yet. And I think that's also why a lot of times in horror, um, like It Follows was his first, well, his first horror movie, Texas Chainsaw, where their first scary movie um, can be so like profound and affect you in such a big way because you don't know his or her beats yet. Right. Right. Well, I think Jordan Peele is a good example oh, of of an artist great. that has come out and and blew everyone away because one that was not what they expected from him, yep. and and two he blended genres so masterfully um, that it just you, you don't know 
like like you talked about, you know, with foreign horror films, not knowing when the beats are coming and you just have no idea what to expect. And and that is doubly horrific. <laughs> yeah. And what a like perfect example, Jordan Peele. And then there was another one I watched recently that I felt that way about. I, it was a new one. Oh, oftentimes, like on Shutter, I, I have a feeling you're also on Shutter. Um, on Shutter, I uh, like just randomly go find one. You don't even have to hear a thing about it yet. Like, just grab one. Okay, that one, uh, I don't know, that one looks fine. It's got a scary face on the thing. Just grab it, just watch it. Because again, you just don't know. And that's, to me, the ultimate horror experience I ever had was the Blair Witch Project in the theater. And if you, I mean, you can't really top the who made this question than, than, than what you asked when you watched that movie, right? You're in the theater, it's, you know, we were a lot younger then, right? And, and I mean, it literally looked like you could have made this yourself, you know? Right. And so you're like, who made, what psycho is behind this? That kind of thing. <clears throat> and, and, then, and it's not just found footage. It's the actors didn't seem like they were reading lines. It's, and, and then that goes back to like the beat thing again, right? Like there wasn't the like typical dialogue. And, and that doesn't have to mean, by the way, that doesn't have to mean like instead of, you know, rehearsed dialogue, you have like, you know, uh, dialogue as you would speak it. No, I mean, it could be the, you could you could have a whole movie where each character only says one word um, di well, dialogue at all times. And that would be off putting and strange. That would be unknown to us. So that's why, number one, one of the most like encouraging things I could say to like a young writer, right, or a young filmmaker is to totally not be afraid of that weird idea you have where you want all the characters, literally all the characters, they just speak in one word each time, mom, son, you know, day's time, nighttime, right? That's such a weird idea, right? Do that one, do it, do it. Because we're all looking for fresh and, and that unknown style is as scary as an unknown what's in the closet, is as scary as unknown what's under the bed. In fact, it's even scarier, is, is not, knowing who's telling you this story yet. So I'm um, like, that would be my biggest encouragement. And also that would be one danger to writing um, the same style in every book you write is that people, you know, eventually like, well, I know what's coming next. This is a Josh Mallerman book, you know? <laughs> and I think that, and I think that um, by uh, stretching between Carol and Bird Box and on this, the day of the pig and Carpenter's Farm, I think there's, by stretching between them, it could keep a reader on their toes as well. So, right, all, all I'm really saying with that long winded um, thing is definitely do that idea that you think, is that too weird? Yeah, you do that one. Absolutely. <laughs> Josh, you are also a songwriter, and uh, this is a um, uh, an interesting combination to me because. Um, I also am kind of an armchair musician and, uh, when, when I'm trying to, um, kind of unstick myself or if I'm, I'm wrestling with a plot point of something I'm writing, I, you know, I'll pick up a guitar and I'll, I'll just kind of noodle around and, and sometimes the, the act of switching brain gears, um, you know, helps my subconscious mind to, to think through things. Or maybe the the music itself is uh, an, an inspiration point. I don't know, um, but you know, there there's something fascinating to me about songwriting. It it really is um, magic in a lot of ways because where when you're writing prose, you might have you know eighty to one hundred to one hundred twenty thousand words to to completely paint a tapestry, and then. A, a great songwriter can do a similar thing in three minutes and, you know, maybe a hundred words, you know, max. Um, first, uh, do you see uh, a, a kinship between uh, writing prose and writing music? And, uh, you know, do you do you feel like that the two make you um, a, a more rounded artist? Uh, do you think that one robs the other? Uh, how do you feel about Man, you know, painting in, in two different mediums. Such, such a good question. Um, the, the thing that made that question just extraordinary to me was, do they rob each other? Um, I've, always, I've been asked before, do they inform each other? 
and do they influence each other? But I've never been asked, do they rob each other? And yes, they have in my life. And before I go on real fast, what do you play guitar? Uh, yeah, the guitar, keyboards. Oh, drums. cool. Yeah. Same. But, I, I'm pretty terrible at the drums, but I love playing them. <laughs> yeah, not, not fantastic at, at any of them, but I'm <laughs> proficient, you know. Yeah, I'm like Charlie Watts. I try to keep it like just four on the floor. Let's just, right. you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked pretty good for Charlie. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how have they robbed each other? What a great addition to that question is because for a long time, because um, I was have always been trying to write both at once. One, in fact, I was probably trying to write stories before uh, songs, or I was actually, but anyway, the point is, the music, any small idea became a song. And any big idea became a book. Now, that seems to make some sense, except by the time Bird Box came out, I had written some 14 novels and like, gosh, like 300 songs and zero short stories. And that is a bizarre thing as a writer and a yeah. reader of all of short stories and, and horror and all this. And especially I'm aware of how potent and maybe even the most, the most potent um, uh, medium, the short story is for horror. I just, I didn't have any because every short idea was a song. And so in a bizarre way, the songs robbed the writing side of the shorter stuff. And the conversely, I, cause I've always had like a fantasy of writing like, um, like a concept album, but not in a lofty way, more like a concept, like sci-fi album, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a great, I had an, I thought it was a great idea where it opens like, with like a bar in Texas and like an astronaut enters the, but this is song one, the astronaut enters like screaming, we're not alone, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so the song would be, we're not alone. And, but that kind of thing. But then the bigger ideas became the book. So there has been, there was originally some sense of like, you are supposed to go here and you go there. And then I was asked to do a short story for um, Doug Marano and D. Alexander Ward in a, in a, it's called Shadows Over Main Street. And it was supposed to be like a Lovecraftian, um, you know, sort of homage thing. But I, it, mine really wasn't like that. And, and oftentimes in those theme things, like, yeah, it's a little like that, but it's not, you know. Um, but it was my first short story that I had written maybe since like literally since high school. And it got published in that thing. And I was like, oh my God, I have a short story out. And that opened a floodgate. Now, I still haven't written that many, like maybe like 40 or something. Yeah. But I mean, I've, I've written 33 novels. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, it's very bizarre not to have these short stories. And it's something that kind of bothers me is that I want to be better at writing short stories. Well, guess what? It's the, it's the thing I've put the least amount of work into. So, okay, it makes sense that the novel is home, the song is home, and the short story and the script are things that you're trying to get better at. Okay, fine. Fair enough. Where the music and books have helped each other, and I wonder if you feel this way, is that, you know, I'm, I've toured with my, my band, my best friends, for like six, seven years straight, and meaning we had no apartments. We literally lived on the road for six or, it was like six and a half years. Wow. And we, and we never, we weren't playing to thousands of people. Don't get the wrong idea here. It was like 20 people average a night getting paid. I think I made, I was asking the boys this the other day. I think we made like $2,500 each a year in that stretch. We'd get, you know, we'd go to the bar, we'd get fed, we'd get wasted. They'd give us booze. We just needed gas to like kind of get to the next town and, and get something to eat maybe in the middle of the day. We had no rent because we didn't have apartments. We were literally on the road for six and a half years. And so the point is there was so much, and I was writing novels on the road also. So the point is every time I sit down to write a rough draft, I always feel like there's like a, like an overly aggressive shirtless, sweaty drummer, unseen, invisible in the room with me. <laughs> and then I write the book to his beat in the same way that I play the guitar to Derek. And I don't ever look over at the dude and I sometimes he can drive me insane. I'm like, dude, slow down or speed up or whatever it is. Right. And oftentimes it can get me in trouble because if he's playing like a, um, a, uh, not jazz, but like a little, like a weird time in time signature. Um, when I, when I go back to rewrite the book, if I'm not aware of that time signature, it could all feel real choppy. Right. right because when right. you're writing the rough draft, like, 
I don't mean for something to sound choppy or bad, but a lot of the time when you come back, you're like, who the, who wrote this crap, right? <laughs> so, like, it's almost, like, astonishing how much better the rewrite is than a rough draft. And so, like, so I think that the music has given me, I care more about the feel of a novel than I do the, you know, the vocabulary of the author. I care more about the spirit of a novel than I do almost anything else. And in, in that makes it almost sound like I'm like, like a punk or something, but it, it's not in my band's not punk and or anything like that. It's not that it's more like, maybe think more like beatnik, maybe think more like Kerouac. Like, I, I really cherish the like rhythm, the spirit, the um, the oomph of a, of a novel. And then this is also why I feel like to me, like, in, you know, I was kind of joking, but kind of not. That's why they're all five stars that I've been reading. Right. Because it's like, like, yeah, let's roll. Let's roll. Let's just do it. And I just love it. I love that I'm reading and I love that you wrote this. And that's enough. Like, yeah, we can talk about, OK, the characters. There wasn't enough development. Great. You flub that note on the guitar. Great. Who cares? Did you have fun? Yeah, so did I. And I feel like music has given me that. It has made the has made it impossible for the writing side to ever become stiff, pretentious, um, cold for me. I think the music has added a serious warmth. How the books have helped the music, I don't know. I don't know. But but that would be the answer, I think, overall to that question. Josh, you you wrote and you alluded to this earlier that that you wrote a number of books uh, before submitting any of them. Uh, not only um, <laughs> did you write a number of books that that didn't sell, you wrote a number of books that you didn't try to sell. Um, was this a was this a conscious thing on your part, or did you feel like you were, um, you know, honing your chops along the way? Um, what was your your thought process in in writing books that that you didn't do anything with? I think at some point, you know, because people would start to ask you, right? You're on the road or you come home for a minute and, and now you have four books. What do you mean you have four books? You know, like two, like you're not a writer until you start writing, right? And you're not prolific until you write your second because then how soon after your first was that, right? And then right. you start patterns and blah, blah, blah. And you come home, you have four books now and your friends and family are like, well, what are you going to do with these? And then you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And then you write a fifth book and you blah, blah, blah. So, but I think that the ultimate sort of fail safe I had that enabled me to um, be, uh, what's the right, I don't want to say righteous, but to, but to look at the books in the right way. With that, that is without dollar signs in my eyes. That is without pressure of some sort of bizarre sale. That is without worrying what an agent would think. Literally just blindly, gloriously just writing. I think the fail safe was that I was playing songs every night in a different city. So I had the like satisfaction of an, uh, of a performer audience, like moment. I had writing songs with my bandmates and they learn them. And then we would make an album and we would put it out and we would play songs in Seattle and, and then in Portland the next night and then Vancouver. And if you're doing that, it was like that, that bug, the um, uh, feedback bug, the, playing to a crowd, writing for a crowd bug was all satiated. And so the books, they were never, not even remotely a hobby. It, it, it was from the word go, it was like, I'm, we are, we are writing novels, you know, from the word go, but there was no, no, like kind of like uh, subconscious, even like pressure of someone has to read these. I had like, um, when the band started, uh, me and the other songwriter, Mark Owen, we would record a bunch on like a four track, right? Cassette. And then we would make like 20 copies and we send the 20 copies out to our 20 friends. And we would, we would like, you know, make the co the cover. We would copy the cover at Kinko's. That sounds like a, like a alliteration. <laughs> copy the cover at Kinko's. And then anyway, so then the same thing happened with the books. I would finish one and then I'd send it out to a list of like five friends, you know? I would print out the book, the rough draft and give it to like the band we're opening up for. Like the guy I became friends with in that band, you know, Hey, uh, Bill, you want to, you want to read this book? I wrote finished yesterday. Yeah, man. You know, you just give them a stack of papers, right. That you printed out at a weird Kinko's in like, you know, Cheyenne or something. So then like there was never a sense then 
of, of urgency. And I remember one point, Chad, the bass player in the highest run, he, he said to me, like, maybe you should consider like self publishing these. And I was like, maybe. And I, and I, I just, I didn't know if I had the, what's it called? Focus, energy, time to like put into that, what would have to go into that. I was already in a do-it-yourself band and we were like, you know, again, touring every day and blah, blah. It seemed like lunacy to throw on trying to publish novels of my own in there. And I just kind of had this blind, wonderfully blind um, assumption that it was all going to work out, that uh, these books would be on the shelf. I used to interview myself. I used to have, I'm not lying when I say this, I used to have phony conversations with imaginary editors. I used to get in like I used to get in debates with these editors about like <laughs> points. That, yeah, no, about things they said about the book that like no, like obviously they didn't say it. The person's not even real, and I'd be like, "What are you talking about?" You know, like I mean, like seriously. And I had like I had like books. I imagined them all lined up on the shelf. Like there was an empty space on this wall in this one uh, one place I ended up living after that six year stretch on the road, and I just imagined them all like lined up there, like literally. As if they were there, Hank, like saw them there, man. And I just kind of assumed this was going to happen. Then Bird Box does. And this is the most surreal thing you can imagine because people will be like, is this surreal? Having like Sandra Bullock in uh, as Mallory. I'm like, "Uh, yeah, no kidding. That's real. But you know what's more surreal than that? Watching the actual details of what was a fantasy being filled in of what was the delusion, a wonderful, happy delusion, being filled in and to actually see the, now I'm looking right at, over the same shoulder, a, the line of like published books on the shelf. And I do have an editor that I don't actually really argue with, but <laughs> in fact, that side of it is way different than, than, I've always, than I always anticipated, by the way. And so, so I don't know, there, yeah, there's always been, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's always just been sort of this blind, you know, blind engine behind this whole thing. I, I interviewed um, Brandon Sanderson, the the fantasy author, oh, uh, right. a couple of Dude. years ago. That's yeah, amazing. oh, it was it, it was so much fun. Um, like, but I often just read like his newest and read like I can't even believe you're saying this. She literally just finished like a whole series of his. Oh, that's that's so fun. Um, but he was talking about that he had written, um, uh, and I don't want to misquote him, but I, I think seven full novels, full fantasy novels, you know, big doorstop novels before getting published. And uh, he said that he had made up his mind that he was a writer, whether he was published or not, that he this was something that that he was uh, that he was uniquely equipped to do or, or or his passion was this. And he said that if he was never published, that one day his children, you know, were going to go through all of his belongings after he had passed on and there would just be closets and closets just filled with manuscripts that he had written because being published was not uh, a, uh, you know, a a watermark for whether he thought of himself as a writer or not. And I've, I've always loved that. Same, a hundred percent the same. There was no, it was like, this is happening no matter what I didn't. um, I never submitted a single book to an agent. Never, not once. I didn't submit anything to a publisher, not once. I, what happened was, it, I mean, it, I don't have to go through the whole story. It's, it's even like on Wikipedia or something. But like a friend, a friend from like high school and from my past, who's now a, a great friend still, but friend from like my past kind of showed up and he got one of my books to a lawyer that represents authors. He, the lawyer then also introduced me to an eight, uh, to a manager. And with the manager and lawyer, they shopped Bird Box to Kristen Nelson, the agent who took it on and, and so forth. So, but at that point, when they, sh- when they shopped it to Kristen, when they submitted it, that was, I think I had written like eight or nine or something. And by the time Bird Box came out, because I, I said to myself, listen, no matter what happens, you were writing about two a year before Bird Box got picked up by Kristen. And I never want you to lose that, no matter what. If you, if Bird Box does get picked up, which it did, and it comes out, and if it does well, which it did, mostly thanks to the movie, but before then too. 
And then it's like, but always, no matter what's going on, I want you to try to write about two books a year, blah, blah. And I have through, through time. So by the time Burn Box came out, I had like 14, 15 novels written. And so you could kind of be like, you know, what would you be? Why would you write another one? You, don't you want these to come out? But the whole engine behind this all is what you were saying, Brandon was saying, is that publishing wasn't the final goal. Right. Um, fortune, fame, whatever, like and these kind of bizarre words, these tantalizing words, these were never like the goal. Like the goal was just to write and and with, with joyfully and and with and with spirit and with work and with and with all that all that stuff. But that was that's the goal. So I don't think, man, I don't think Hank, like even with Bird Box ended up on the bestseller list with, and again, mostly because of the movie, this incredible movie and all this other stuff. Now I think we're, now I have nine books out in some form or another, all this. I really don't think, man, that it, you could ever top the experience of wrapping the rough draft. I, I really don't. I, I, I've, I've, I, in everything I've experienced, there's still nothing sweeter, nothing that hits that, um, that core contentedness than wrapping a new rough draft. Nothing. Absolutely. Not, Absolutely. Yeah. Not yeah. even seeing the cover art, getting an amazing blurb from maybe like someone that you really love. All that stuff is mind bending, but there's nothing like that rough draft, wrapping a rough draft. And that is how it has been since day one. And getting to the end of that uh, rough draft, that there's nothing more powerful than typing that. Right. So with that in mind, if you're publishing books and you have even some success with it or whatever, like why would you then suddenly only adhere to the career arc line, right? So you put out Mallory. Well, now you better get to work on the next book that you plan on putting out. No, 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 no. We're, we're going to just, uh, maybe I'm writing this one for no reason. Great. Why would you do that? Well, writing for a reason got me here, didn't it? So, right. so that's, <laughs> yeah. Well, and is, maybe it's not for no reason. I mean, you obviously were deriving uh, some sort of uh, pleasure, fulfillment, yeah. whatever it is, from the the art of writing. It, it was it was doing something for you, and and maybe you were the only audience for that project. Yep, a hundred percent. And like, yep, exactly what you're saying. And but you know, I I think I say like I even wrote a book recently about a guy who who um was in a writing group and blah, blah, blah. And he ends up writing, and this is in the book, he ends up writing a nonfiction book about that, those days called For No Reason. And the, the idea, I know you know this, but the idea is like, not for fame, not for fortune, but it, those aren't the only words to say not for. There's also not for, um, uh, even for an agent. Right. You know, like, like, we're talking literally just, like Brandon said in that interview, like a closet full. I, I, I started a, um, me and my friends made a crazy movie and we had to name uh, sort of like a, like our production company, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like A24 presents, right? Right. And so then right. I was like, ooh, call it a casket full of rough drafts, you know? <laughs> because that to me, and that's kind of like the same thing as that closet full, right? Is like the idea of like just a coffin with like a hundred uh, unpublished novels in it. Yeah, that sounds fun. That's cool. <laughs> well, speaking of projects that and their intended audience, um, the the thing that brought us together today is you've got a new book, um, that released yesterday. When people are hearing this, and the audience is intended for more than just you, um, a house at the bottom of a lake. Um, I, Josh, I'm fascinated by the beginnings of things and and where things spring to life, uh, if you will. Um, what was it about a house at the bottom of a lake? Was it, uh, was it an, an idea about characters? Was it, uh, you know, a what if scenario? What, what was the thing that birthed this uh, book for you? Well, my fiance, Allison is from Michigan's upper peninsula and upper peninsula is shortened, to, is shortened to UP. And so if you are from the UP, you are a youper. So Allison is a youper and I went up there with her to her parents had way like 10 hours from Detroit, but still in Michigan, um, way the hell up there. And they have a lodge that's finished. They're hundred percent finished. Allison is. And they have like this finished lodge on a lake, this awesome old place. And there's a sauna, not sauna, sauna. That's like pretty much pushed up to like the water and the lake, blah, blah, blah. And there was a canoe 
And Allison and I go out in the lake and then we kind of go into this little, so yeah, not a second lake, but this little inlet like area, whatever. And then there's a tunnel under, not a tunnel, but like a, like a little bridge overpass thing. So you got to go under it, but it, there's some length to it. And the concrete walls inside of there were just splattered with graffiti, right? And when you get to the other side, even though that first lake seemed sort of like uninhabited, like the second ones felt like you were in nature and the water felt darker and there was an eagle's nest out there. And I was like, Ooh, this is kind of like, this just got kind of like spooky in a way, <laughs> you know, like it was like a little later in the day. We're like still canoeing. like, how far are we from that finished lodge? And how far are we from Detroit now? Like, <laughs> like 10 hours and these three lakes away now, huh? And, <laughs> and I, I never turning to Allison, we were somewhat newer then. And um, <clears throat> so we were falling in love and we're on this canoe. And I said to her, like, man, can you imagine how scary it would be if we like passed over like the top of like a church right now? If we looked over the edge of this canoe and there was like a, a spire of a church and it, that means it led all the way down to the front door. And we were both like, oh, God, like that. That sounded scarier than finding like a body, you know? Right. I was like, what would be in there? What lived in the, now and all of a sudden I wish it was a church in the book. Now then that'll have to be a different one, but (laughs) a a church at the bottom of the lake. But so we were both like, blah, blah, blah. blah. And then the second I got back to her place, I was like, okay, I got to write this like right away. And instead of me and Allison, I, I use James and Amelia who are 17 and falling in love. And I think that it's, I think it's typically like most authors, we don't like to like say like, this is a metaphor for this, right? But this one's just, it's too obvious not to point out that their first day, these 17 year olds, they find, they pass over the roof of a house, fully a full house submerged at the bottom of this lake. And they spend a summer exploring it. And it's just impossible not to see the direct metaphor, the line that they deeper they get into exploring the house, the deeper they're falling in love, the deeper into the summer. Um, and that right there is, is the, is the nugget is like the kernel, the, the crux of the whole story. Love it. I love it. Um, we're going to put links to the book in the show notes of this episode. A house at the bottom of a lake uh, is when you're hearing this is out available everywhere. Now a Kindle edition paperback and audio book. Um, what do you think about the audio book? Uh, interpretations of your work, Josh? Oh, great question. I love this one. And I love, um, I love really all of them so far. One, but the one right away with Bird Box, because that was my first one. And the first time I heard someone do that, and I was like, holy cow, right? The one, and she's incredible. And she did Mallory also. But there was one instance where I actually thought the audiobook made the book better, like better. I mean, you can argue all of them do. I mean, you know what I mean, though. Yeah, yeah. You, you just think it's a different version or something. Yeah. A different experience, slightly different experience. But Black Mad Wheel, I love the book. I love them all, but I, I love the book, whatever. But that dude that read that book, there was some rhythm to his speech and some confidence to his speech that I'm not sure was in the writing, man. And I listened to that audio book and I'm like, that was the moment I realized how special like the narrator can be. And and started really paying attention to that. And Allison, um, she does audiobooks all the time, and she's always talking about the narrator, like the experience of being with the narrator and all that. I'm super fascinated with that. Why? Because like you, um, I'm a musician, so there's some sense of like in a weird way, an audiobook's like a bizarre album in a way, right? Right. And and you can even make it more so, as you can imagine. I do have a fantasy of reading one myself, but I also, I just don't have, as you can hear right now, I don't, you know, I'm not Vincent Price. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I I saw, I saw more, I sound more like a neurotic Jewish guy that I am than I do like Vincent Price. So it's like, I don't, I don't want to like ruin the scare by being like, you know, I don't want the narrators to sound more scared than the reader. Well, I I think there's probably a perfect project out there for you though. Um, Keep, keep your ears open. You, you never know. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think like keep an open mind, like, to you know, like that huge book I'm writing now, maybe that's the one. No, probably not. Probably not that one. But (laughs) maybe like this other one about a writer. I don't know. You know, you're right. One of them is going to make sense eventually. We're like, oh, that's it. That's the one. That's the one I'll read. 
And I, I'm excited to do it. But then, man, I talked to, um, I know the guy that read Unbury Carol. And he, I mean, he did that in like three days, dude. And it's like, that book is like, it's, I want to grab it, but I don't know. It's like 400 pages. So that, are you telling me you not only read 130 pages a day, but like on tape, read without like problems, without having to stop, without, I mean, it really, it That's really crazy. is crazy. I know, right? Like if you right now, and when we hang up, if you just started reading a book out loud, you're going to make a mistake on the third sentence, on the seventh, you know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah. Right. And it's like, to this dude, he's like, yeah, we did the first third today. I'm like, what do you mean you did the first third today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dyslexia would kick in and that would be the end of that project for you know, it's start over, start over. Well, you know, my, the do it yourself um, sensibility in me, there's this one little side of me that's like, dude, just roll the mic in your in your house. And even with the mistake, apologize to the reader. Like just right. as if you're in the room, just be like, I mean, oh, sorry. That would be so that. much fun, by the right? way. Right. That could be like fun to be like, okay, sorry. I know I keep screwing that up. Let me, let me just hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I think well, so too. I think there's something in there, right? Like a really honest reading of, of a narration of one of your own books. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Josh, we are we are bumping up on an hour now. And uh, this is this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm going to put links to a house at the bottom of the lake in the show notes of this episode to make it easy for folks to find it. If people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they find you online? Well, it used to be that joshmallerman.com was just kind of like, oh, whatever, it's got some news. But my website now is actually pretty exciting because I posted for free an entire novel up there that I wrote and like po I serialized it on the website during the beginning of this pandemic. And it's free. Is that Carpenter's Farm? Yep, Carpenter's Farm. Yeah, there's no reviews there. There's no likes or this. I mean, it's literally just a book that they uh, are totally readable in terms of presentation, the font and everything. Um, and a whole novel just sitting there. So the joshmellerman.com is a fun website now because of that. And then really, it's just my name. There's only one Alan Mallerman. It's um. My name on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and, and the website. Excellent. We'll link that up as well. Josh, this has been so much fun uh, chatting today. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Oh, man. Same to you. Yeah, you're really you're really great at this, and your questions were really cool. And they, they all, each one of them had, the, had an original flair to them that I hadn't been asked before. That was very, very exciting. So thank you. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career, meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels, along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one -on -one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden costs, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com